We're the Con Guys, and this is the Con Guys Show, coming to you straight from the nerdy heart of Hollywood, California. And this is Jim with theconguy.com. She's been here with theconguy.com. Katie here, aka the Con Girl. Zordon did not want five teenagers with attitude. My name is Derek Sam. I'm Danae Sams, and that's my brother. We are your home for news, opinions, and interviews from the world of Comic Cons and fandoms, your ultimate insiders for all things. Welcome to the Con Guy, where we self proclaim geeks and filmmakers from the nerdy heart of Hollywood, California. We gather to discuss fan conventions and the latest news from our favorite films and franchises. We like to say, if you will find it at Comic Con, we will talk about it here on the show. And right now, we have hit the month of May, which means some great big movies are coming out and also a really big uh, holiday that we like to celebrate. It's not necessarily on the calendar yet. We like to call it uh, Star Wars Day, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Um, what are the other two? There's, it's May the, it's, what's the fifth one? Revenge, Revenge of the Fifth? Yeah. And then Revenge of the Sixth, right? <laughs> Depends on who you ask, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All but listen, this... Fact, on May the 4th, that's 10 years, our first that's date, right. 10 years ago on May the 4th. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so amazing. We're going to introduce each other in just one second but just to let everybody know we just celebrated all these cool star wars uh, events we have some cool um movies coming out but this month this month of may is national foster care month and we thought what better way to kind of like talk about foster care than to kind of like talk about it in in pop culture and how it's being presented in some of the biggest movies and tv shows of our day we're going to highlight some of our favorite foster stories from the worlds of sci-fi and fantasy including a major character from one of our favorite franchises who just had a season finale just a couple of weeks ago. I wonder who that is, along with some special guests who are here to share about their own experiences. My name is Jim. I am, you can, you can find me on um, Instagram at James D Fry. I have not fostered, but the folks here tonight, except for Cheeseman, the, some of the folks here tonight have some great stories and you've heard, um, con guy Derek kind of talking about it a little bit through the week, so we are really excited. Let's go ahead and introduce first in the Brady Bunch box below me, Mr. <laughs> Jay Underwood. Hey, you gang, <laughs> so glad to have you tonight. Tell Man, us a little bit to... about yourself. Sure, no, it's, it's it's great to be with y'all. Um, I have been different things, I am currently a uh, pastor at a Calvary Bible Church in Burbank. California. Um, prior to that, I spent 20 plus years in the entertainment industry um, doing movies and television as an actor. Um, and, uh, and, and then along the way, uh, both my wife and I became uh, foster parents and ended up adopting three children that we fostered. And um, that's, that's me. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. As we go around the horn, we have the lovely couple, Kangai Derek, and sorry, Derek, your better half, your much more beautiful and talented half, Lara. That's with you. And you that's introduce yourselves. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lara. Um, I also work in the entertainment industry. Came here in 2010 uh, to make beautiful stories. Um, I'm in the studio system right now, but before that, I was a independent filmmaker, producer, anything really uh, for a really long time. And um, actually, uh, thought I would never stay this long, but now we have had seven foster children in the last three years. Um, so it's hard to imagine leaving here, mm -hmm. knowing that all of our foster kids live here. So. You know, yeah, kind of tied to this town now, I think. Um, yeah, for yeah, better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name's Derek. I am, of course, a regular co host on the Con Guy show and a contributor to the Con Guy.com. I am a writer and software engineer. Um, I've worked at some of the studios at different times, um, in various office and clerical jobs, and getting to proofread scripts a few times. That was a lot of fun. Um, it's favorite thing, but yeah, I already gave the introduction for the two of us and what we'll be talking about tonight, but we're also showing off some of our favorite Lego sets. Yeah, I wanted nice. to like, we're gonna zoom in right here. Yes, we got we got Grogu, 
We got the Falcon. We got the Upside Down. You can't see it, but we got the Friends, yeah, Central Perk, Lego. Mm -hmm. Ah. Um, so Night Grogu, Grogu is uh, is Lego. Grogu is not Lego. No, no, he's plush. Oh, okay, That's and we got, the, we got the Grogu right. Lego. In fact, I just saw it in my son's room that we've got to put together. It's it's scaring me. It's oh. scaring me. So. Well, you know, that's the next purchase. It's kind of a uh, expensive hobby, so yeah. we got to be responsible. Yeah, wait till you start collecting NECA figures, then. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and just for you guys out there, I'm gonna put him on the spot. We are trying to twist Derek's arm into really spearheading an awesome Lego podcast series. Oh. Yes. So yes. we'll see if it, we'll see. He's a busy man, so uh, I think that I think people would just love. I him. can make time for important things like <laughs> <laughs> priorities. Priorities. Uh, speaking of important things, let's just say this right up front. We are going to talk about several different fandoms and how their stories have affected us. And so naturally, there's going to be spoilers. Some of these are a little bit older. Some of them super recent, a couple weeks old. So if you hear us mention a title or a fandom that you have not yet finished with, proceed with caution. These are cool stories we're talking about tonight. And it's a really, it's not just a cool topic. It's an important topic. So hopefully you guys can... Uh, if you get a chance, share this podcast with friends, especially you know friends who might be interested in fostering. So I, I hope you guys get as much out of this as like these 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 folks here. I, we've heard their stories, and this is just so great. So we're gonna start. We're gonna start right up front, Derek. Who's our first? Um, our, our, our first I, I thought this special important person was me that you were. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Got about cheese man here. There screenwriter and one of the founding con guy people very important person obviously here on the show as well i'm, I'm fostering Luke right now no, I'm just again yeah. Yeah. yeah basically basically my apologies my apologies cheeseman um cheeseman's had a really busy weekend we have we, we have a couple different podcasts that we filmed one this weekend we did one just a second ago and that word this is the, this is the one we've been kind of looking forward to because this is the one that has kind of the meat of some some goodness about well they're all good but anyways i've been excited to talk about this and derek has really been pushing this and we're and just so you know like me and luke we've been friends with derek and laura for so long and just seeing the we, the were, in their wedding. we, yes. were, we were in their wedding the cool one of the coolest weddings ever and just seems um but just the their journey with the foster system and some of the just beautiful wonderful kids that they've had mm. the pleasure of making them an important um, impact on was just been amazing. So there, I think our, we have a, a we're going to start right here up front. Who are we starting with when we talk about foster stories? Uh, well, that right there is Din Djarin, the Mandalorian mm -hmm. holding the child, AKA baby Yoda, AKA Grogu. AKA. Um, what? Din Grogu. Din Grogu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's so right. A lot you of got the name on the last it. episode, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I know we all love the, the Mandalorian. We all love Baby Yoda slash Grogu. And it's been talked about a lot. Not, I've only seen a few articles online, not a whole lot of talk about this really being a foster care story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I do understand John Favreau wanted to make a story about a single dad. But That's when fantastic. you actually, yeah, when you look at this from the beginning and what they go through mm -hmm. um, in their relationship, it really is a story about foster care ultimately. Um, it's at first it's a bounty that he goes after, but then he sees, oh, it's a little baby, even though he's 50 years old. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, unexpectedly he's, you know, basically just finds himself in this position where this kid is in a dangerous situation and he's got to take him in and take care of him. And he is, he willingly does it, uh, maybe a little reluctant at first, but mm -hmm. he makes adjustments and then he has to do things like get him to a school um, help him make contact with what they call his own kind, but ultimately it's, you know, the Jedi. Um, and then in that process also has to come to terms with letting him go and live with someone else. And um, one of the spoilers, if you haven't seen the second season that is old now, but um, it, the second season ends with them finally making contact with the Jedi and then a Jedi shows up and then there's this cool reveal that actually it's Luke Skywalker and he's going to take Rogu and go train him in the ways of the force. And it's bittersweet because it's great. Like this, this child who had had to set aside his training as a Jedi for years and years is finally going to get to go and continue it. And so he's going with another Jedi and he can go fulfill this great destiny. But Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, who's grown attached to him at this point, has to let go. And we got to see some of that experience. And 
in some things that we've seen, um, I, usually when foster care and even adoption, when they're portrayed um, in, in movies and TV shows, it's either really negative and you see like just this horrible situation that kids are going through and it's, you know, uh, the foster home might be abusive or just neglectful or something awful. Mm -hmm. um, or it's, you know, it's fine, but then it's something like, like the movie Instant Family, where it's sweet, but not a very accurate portrayal of how the system actually functions. And then um, it ends with, you know, an adoption. Yeah. And I think even some people we've talked to don't fully understand the difference between foster care and adoption, that foster care is usually temporary. And even when you form those bonds and you are a family for a while, very often at some point, you've got to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately in our situation, you know, a lot of the kids that we've um, helped be, to reunify with family, we've been able to keep in contact. We were able to, you know, form some friendships there and we still see them. But that goodbye is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And it was really meaningful for me to see that on screen, you know, growing up as a kid loving Star Wars and then seeing this character that I thought was so cool and then seeing him go through something that I had experienced um, as a foster dad, like watching, um, having to watch his, his baby ultimately like go live with someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we were catching up and watching Boba Fett. Does anybody else want to chime in? I know you. Yeah. Well, we're right there with me. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're talking about like just the experience of watching kind of our experience on screen, yeah. but in a fantasy world. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty cool, but um, for those who don't know, you have to watch the last three episodes of Boba Fett to catch up to the third season of Mandalorian, mm -hmm. which is just a crossover thing. Um, but somewhere in there, uh, Din Djarin goes back and he wants to make contact with Grogu and just see how he is. He wants to give him a little gift. And um, I just remember the moment where he um, is uh, confronted with ah Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, is you have to really think, is it going to be good for him to see you? Um, because he's going, he, he's doing his Jedi training for those who don't remember, you know, a Jedi, you know, Anakin Skywalker did it totally wrong, right? You're not supposed to form attachments, you know, like you are, you are single and you're like, you're, you have one destiny, one uh, job, right? And, and you have to do that with your Jedi, fellow Jedi, but like you're ultimately, you can't form attachments Mm -hmm. Therefore, family. So Grogu, of course, has his experience of attaching to Din Djarin, But then when he want, Din Djarin wants to go back and visit with him, he has to really think about that. Like, is it going to be better for him to see me and like want to come back and remember those attachments? Yeah. Or do I walk away and let him just do his thing? And um, this is just going to be a big spoiler throughout the whole night. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, he makes that choice like it sucks but I'm going to walk away because ultimately he's trying to do what's better for his, you know, pseudo child um, that he's ultimately let go of. And like, that was really like yeah. the point. Do you where... remember what he says to Ahsoka though? I think it's to Ahsoka when he's there. Jay, did you watch this already? No, you know no I'm, I was like, I don't think I have. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> that's Sorry. Right. You can cover your no, ears. That's okay. But he's talking to Ahsoka. <laughs> he's, there's a line where he says, I just need to know that he's safe. I just want to yeah. make sure he's safe. So he, um, is it in, I think the second season, he gets this spear that's made of the Beskar metal and he goes to the, the forger lady that it does all the armor yep. for them. And she like melts it down and makes it into this chainmail shirt, mm -hmm. a little tiny one to fit Grogu. So and that's a gift that he wraps up and like has given to him. Um, yeah, like, he wants I, to deliver it himself, yeah, but because, he decides to give it to her. To yeah. Give to, yeah. And we were feeling that because, you know, with, when you don't know if you're going to see your former foster kids much or not, like just sending them a gift, like something that is going to help them, something that'll be meaningful to them in some way, you know, um, just saying, I just want to know, I want to make sure that they're safe. Um, and that's, yeah, we were really connecting with that. Just seeing him <laughs> like having to, having to love from a distance. Sometimes that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you like, um, in the story of Grogu, mm -hmm. what, who, like, Bo Katan, how how did she play into this? Like the other people that are involved, and then I would love to throw it to Jay and hear a little bit about your story, mm -hmm. and and uh, we're gonna talk through some other. Um... Oh, he's he's not a Star Wars fan, <laughs> <laughs> as he wears a very prominent yeah. Star Wars. But like I, like I like we had other people that were kind of influential in the story of Grogu. 
how, how, how does that relate? Like as far as like a, a foster care journey, I don't know if that's a, a messed up question or not. Like <laughs> Bo-Katan Bo 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 seemed to very much have a lot of affection towards Grogu, although she was not the foster mother, you know? No, she's very protective though. Yeah. Um, so she has, has always felt this destiny to take up the, you know, the mantle to be like the leader of the Mandalore um, and to lead them back to their home planet. Um, but so I think she just has that instinct to want to be protective. Like, I, I think she has to grow into that for Grogu, but she becomes a protector for him just as much. And they're not a couple, but they certainly become like these like really mm -hmm. amazing, like foster parents in a, for a yeah. Duration of time, and I'm like, yes, let's cosplay that because that's oh, yeah. awesome. Nice. <laughs> are you? Wait, wait, wait. Are you going to be Bo-Katan? Oh man, if only, if only. Oh, I was wow, you could so oh, do you this. Could totally you pull that off. Oh, so cool as Katie Sackoff. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. has the outfit. You can My one wear. wish in life is to meet Katie Sackoff. I'm just putting that out there. So, you know. Jay, I, and I, I would love to hear a little bit of your story. Uh, sure. In terms of um, your foster journey. Yeah. Foster uh, story. My wife and I, we um, left uh, Burbank um, about 15 years ago when I took a church up in uh, the northwest corner of California. And uh, we thought we were done with having kids at the time um, and then um, realized, no, we we, uh, we 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 don't feel like we're we're done. Um, but my wife was at the point where she's like, I'm, I'm not doing the birth thing though anymore. I'm, 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 I'm done with that. And, uh, so that, that left open the door to, uh, adoption. We had a lot of friends at, um, at our church at the time that were also exploring adoption, but they were doing it through the foster system. So you can do private adoptions. You can do international adoptions. Um, I, I personally just feel inclined towards, uh, towards the foster system just in our own neck of the woods kind of thing because there's uh, there's kids all over the world that need families and need parents but that was just something that um that drew us uh and and when you do it that route too um you don't uh end up you don't spend uh you know thousands of dollars on the adoption in fact in the foster system then you're given a stipend to obviously be able to help pay for, you know, their, their, uh, their needs and clothing and food and all of those things. Um, so anyway, we, uh, we were up in, uh, uh, the Northwest corner of California and decided to go ahead and look into it. And, um, there was a, a Christian, um, a foster agency, uh, in Reading that we looked into. And next thing you know, normally it takes like several months to become a licensed foster care family, but there were two kids in Weaverville where we were living that we had known that whose mom was a drug addict and, and, but she would bring them to the church to our youth programs, to our kids programs. That's so called Awana. And so we I, had I, known, I grew up in Awana. Did you do Awana? There you yeah. go. So we had known both Austin and Gianna through Awana and um, they had been pulled uh, out of their home. There was another family that was looking, that had been fostering them, that was looking to adopt them. But as a, uh, as the Sams know, the legal system can be just, just screwy. And, um, and they thought they would be adopting these two kids and then the courts didn't allow them to. And then the dad had to move back up to the Washington for his job. And in any case, Austin and Gianna were going to go back into the system. And, uh, people knew that we were, um, that knew them knew that we were working on becoming a, a foster care family. And um, in the whole of Trinity County, this whole county, I think there were only two or three families and it's a rural county. So they're spread out and they fast tracked us like within a month. And we were all done, signed, sealed, delivered. And, and Austin and Gianna were then with us. And um, so we we had them. Gianna was six. Austin was eight. And um, and and we we started down that road. And then a few years later, we were contacted again by a child protective services that there was a, um, a, a baby uh, that had been born and had been born. Oh, I forget how many weeks premature. Mom was a meth addict. And, um, 
And would you guys be interested? And I was like, I, I was like, I'm not there yet. You know, hun. Uh, and she's like, really? Well, the, the, the baby's in the NICU and they need somebody just to go down and spend time. Do you mind? Do you care if I do that? And I'm like, Oh, this is, I, yeah, okay, okay. Say no. <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah. So she does. And, uh, Oh, about a week or so goes by and she's like, you want to come down and visit? And I thought, I know what's going to happen. And, uh, <laughs> sure enough, I, I go down there and there's our son, Owen, uh, uh, laying there in the crib in the NICU and the, or the, the little plastic, whatever they call those things, incubators, I don't know, whatever. And, uh, and I just looked down at him and that was it. That was, it, you know, it's like that scene in the Mandalorian, um, the first scene where like they, you know, like when they're, he's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hand and, yeah. Well, I said to Julie, I go, it's kind of like, it was kind of like when we first got our first puppy, you know, we went in and there was this whole litter and I knew the moment I touched one exactly, that would be it. That would be the one. So you're trying not to touch them yet, you know, <laughs> and then Owen's there and he's got this little stuffed elephant next yeah. to him. And it's like, you know, the minute you touch him and oh, it's all over. We're, we're good. He's coming home with us, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's, 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 um, that's been our story. I mean, it's, 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 it's been interesting because we set out, you know, we wanted to expand our family. We wanted to have more kids. We had three biological children already. So this made, uh, this made six. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, you think you set out to expand your family and well, we're doing a, a, a good thing here too. And, and giving these kids a home. And, and what we realized was uh, the Lord had other plans too, because um, it, it was, it was not an easy process and you kind of go into it sometimes with rose colored glasses. And, you know, we talked to our other three biological children about it. Oh yeah, we want to do this. We want to do this. And then it all happens and reality sets in and you realize, boy, there's, there's, I got some stuff. Uh, I got some, some sin stuff lurking uh, beneath the surface here that I kind of have to deal with. And so in, a, in any case, we saw how the, the Lord was using that in our own lives too, just to, um, just to mold and shape us and change us into, into being the people that he wanted us to be and to be better parents. And, and, um, and it was a challenge too, for our, our three biological children. But um, as time goes on, it's one of those things too, that, 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 that time does wonders. And, and we're at the point now where I know all of us would say we couldn't imagine our lives without the three kids, you know, and that would, I think, include our biological children would say, the same thing as well. So now on a, on a separate note, I was even thinking as J Derek had mentioned earlier that he was watching one of my films, which was um, the series for the Disney channel called not quite human back in the, uh, back in the eighties and nineties yeah. you know, where I played chip, the Android. So, Hey, there you go. Foster adopt basically. Right. I mean, well, dad Basically. creates, he creates him. <laughs> you know, it's not his biological child. And, uh, and then, but puts it into the family with his sister and, um, and now they've all got to be a family. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Speaking of Android, wait, anyway, two questions. One, can people still see this series or this film? Derek, you found it on YouTube, right? Um, I don't know if I should say publicly oh. that, that okay. is right now. <laughs> okay. I don't know that it's like on the up and up available to stream. I really yeah. hope it would be on Disney Plus, but it you might go, if you can too. hunt for it. <laughs> yeah, but it was it I was surprised when Disney Plus came out and then they have the Disney Channel on Disney Plus and that's what it was made for, but it's nowhere to be seen and I I have no idea why. I mean, we'll I, I can't understand why they wouldn't put it on there at the time when they came out, they became the highest rated shows on the disney channel um but you know <laughs> wow well, i'm sure it'll make it out there but speaking of android, android, fun. yeah but speaking of androids derek uh, you you have uh provided us with one of your favorite examples of androids as yeah. foster children what is this yeah this is well this is data and lal from the episode of uh, star trek the next generation called the offspring um in a way this is a lot like not quite human because um, it's not so much that this child is just brought in to Data's care, but Data does make another android. And it's he refers to her as his daughter. And mm. 
the episode is a, uh, it's a really heavy one. It's very emotional. And I really related to it. Um, which I mean, Laura, maybe some too, but I think I went back and rewatched it after our first foster son reunified. Um, Cause we've also dealt with, you know, infertility issues and still working on that, you know, and it's, and I, I could relate to data as being <laughs> this guy who couldn't really become a dad on his own um, very easily, at least. And then we had a baby that we cared for for a while and then had to say goodbye to um, in this episode. It's, it's, interesting the the issues that come up because there are some episodes that deal with data's you know humanity whether they consider him a person or property and they bring up a lot of interesting philosophical questions of what does it mean to be human and the whole character arc for data is he's trying to become more human all the time mm -hmm. um kind of like chip yeah um but with over a much longer period of time i guess but with, in this episode, The Offspring, someone from Starfleet shows up and says, well, we need to take this other android and go and study her. And there's this whole debate going on about how they want to separate the two of them. Um, and somewhere in there, Lal actually starts feeling emotions and she actually gets scared, which Data is not able to do at this point. And she somewhere in that all of that, too, she starts to malfunction as a result of it. And she's struggling um, and Data is struggling to try and help her. And he's in the end, he's unable to save her. Um, but through all that, too, this guy from Starfleet that came along, he's ends up assisting Data in the laboratory, trying to help her. And he like sees all of this and actually recognizes in the end that Data was really a father at that point, not just a scientist creating some project. Mm -hmm. um, it's really beautiful and really sad. And one of the reasons that I love The Next Generation so much mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when I went back and watched that a couple of years ago, it was data was my support group for a little bit. <laughs> um, and it's, but it's a similar story in that, you know, it was a family formed by unusual means. And also it was only temporary. Um, and it was in some ways hard for people on the outside of that situation to understand that relationship, you know, mm. um, but, and there was also, you know, some debate about, you know, what rights did Data have? What rights did Lal have as a person? Um, and we see that sometimes, you know, just mm -hmm. like, because when you go into family court, there's all sorts of laws. There's all sorts of questions about like the children's rights and the parents' rights. Um, and there are, there are debates and things, and I'm not going to get into all that right now. Just, you know, it's, those are questions that come up. Um, so yeah, that episode is something that I'll, I will probably always get emotional about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Data. <laughs> you know, what, I mean, let's talk about this. Probably one of the best examples that I have seen in, in recent um, pop culture of, of foster care is yeah. Eleven and Hopper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Hop. Right. It, let's talk about this because so like, this is a talk about a stressful situation for everything's trying to pull them apart. But Hopper and Joyce do something. They're, it's just powerful the way that they are able to just make 11 part of their home. Just talk about that. Whoever wants to take that one. <laughs> yeah. Go, Go ahead. I've, I've been talking for a bit. So if either of you all want to jump in. Well, I haven't heard from Cheeseman in a hot minute. But uh, wait, our perspective is a little bit different, though. We well, I'm, I'm curious. So you say that it's beautiful. What makes it beautiful? I think it makes it beautiful because um, Hopper is the – Hopper reaches out to 11 – and he it's unknown the 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 pushback the safety level everything is spinning out of control he's the one person who goes and takes her in and i that's what i find beautiful is that he's not worried about like oh this is gonna i'm not doing this to make my life better over here he's it's just absolute love and he does take her in and joyce as well because spoiler warning you know the most recent season hopper's gone and Joyce is having to take in her a daughter, you know, that she did not bear. And it's a it's some it's somebody else's child and, and take and she's the caretaker for a while. So to get a chance to watch uh, Stranger Things season four, it is all about the bonds of family, family that they chose to have. Um, I do love that. I, I second everything that you just said, Jim, like when Hopper, like you said, he doesn't take her in, you know, to make a better life. He just saw a need and he fulfilled it and then thereby making his life that much better. Um, I do enjoy the moments in, was it season three when he, when, 
you know, hormones are, uh, <laughs> are, are, are around and um, he becomes a father, like a full father figure of like, yeah. keep the door open one inch. And Three inches. Three inches, right? And um, in the Christian world, is like enough room for the Holy Spirit, right? Um, <laughs> and then you just know, like you just see him become this father figure. Um, and it's been it's been a little bit, but didn't he have a daughter at some point that that did pass away? Yeah, his in this first that's in the first that you see a lot yeah. of that. There, the flashback she had some kind of like, terminal illness. So it's kind of like Hopper yeah. just like realizing that he can love again, he can care again, and. Um, and in a lot of ways, I feel like in as a foster parent, you know, you say goodbye and you're like, oh, I'm never going to love again. I mean, often we, we describe it as like, like cl the closest thing is like when you break up with somebody, it's like, oh, I'm never going to find love again. I'm never going to love the way that I love. And then, you know, as I'm sure Jay can attest to, like you love all your children, like, you know, equally with such intensity. And just because you love one, it doesn't take away love from the other. And that's kind of how it's been for our foster experience. It, it kind of makes you wonder, like, why, why do it? You know, um, I think, you know, the difference between foster, the foster in the foster system, the goal always is reunification. And, you know, Jay has been blessed by being able to be in the place of adoption when that was necessary. Um, but really, if you don't want to go through the turmoil of saying goodbye, I mean, no, it's it's been wonderful, but it really is that you do have to know yourself. And honestly, we went in a bit, a bit naive. People tell you, you know, it's going to be hard, but you don't know it until you're like in it. And we have heard friends say that, like, I could never do that because because that would be too hard. That would. And it's good to know that up front about yourself. At the same time, it is it is also such a beautiful thing to open yourself up in a way that you would never be able to otherwise. I think like fostering is such a different way to love. And, you know, I mean, people have often asked, why didn't you just go straight to an adoption agency? Because, of course, we still want to be parents. But um, I think there's some statistics like 400,000 beds are needed in the U.S. alone. And yeah, that's and not something, even worldwide, I think it's about right? Thirty thousand just in LA County, and just in LA, I heard it upwards of like forty up or something. Think, well, it's always changing. It's course, always too. changing, yeah. but yeah. like there's such a need, and just like Jay, we heard it yeah. from our our church as well, and our church family has. There's multiple instances of fostering, fostering to adopting, um, and we really couldn't have done it without yeah. the community, and I think that yeah. makes all the difference. Um, That's the role that Bo-Katan plays. She's part of the Yeah, Bo-Katan is part <laughs> yeah. of the village. All the other Mandalorians, All the Mandalorians who were yeah. there. Yeah, Bo-Katan, the, the armorer, the and uh, Cara Dune in the first season, and yeah. um, Carl Weathers, I forget his character's name. And to, and to follow on what Laura just said, some of the statistics, there are, there are close to 400,000 children and youth in foster care in the U.S. There are about 60,000 children and youth in foster care in California alone, and about 20,000 um, kids, young adults, age out of the U.S. foster system each year. So that, that's a monumental amount. So wow, 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 wow. Yeah, yeah, it it, it really is. Um, it was interesting just to touch on what 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 Derek and Laura were just saying. Laura was talking about the with 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 the foster and adopt system. It, it in some respects, it's not for the faint of heart because there are no guarantees. Um, you have a desire. And I think, again, I think people uh, that look to the foster system as a means to either uh, foster kids for, for, for their different reasons for doing that, or as a means towards adoption, because again, that's what, what my wife, Julie and I knew we wanted to do. Um, and it was because of that, partly that, that there was just such a huge, huge need. I mean, that that should break all of our hearts that there are mm -hmm. children out there, children four hundred thousand, like you just said, Jim. That that um that uh, you know that that need a family. Um, I would I was just reminded of uh, James chapter one verse twenty seven, where it says, "Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this: to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world." So. Uh, this is the way. 
This is the way. It, it, this, is the way. <laughs> this is the way. That's so. But, it's so great. It's so great. But that was that was something that I remember. We had that same thought though. Well, okay, if we go this foster route, man, what you know, the goal is always the reunification. You know, initially for for uh, for the the kids and and birth parents, and and when that doesn't happen, then then you can step in and 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 um, and adopt. Um, but we thought there's still no guarantee. And, and how, how will that kind of go down emotionally with us? Yeah. If you do end up yeah. fostering a child and you have that child, whether it's a week, a month or a year, and then the child ends up going, going back. And can and you we talk had, about that? Yeah, we had, we had a good friend at the time who, and Derek Larkin can certainly speak to that, but we, we had a good friend at the time who had fostered a lot of kids. And we asked her about that. She said, you know, here, here's what I would say to you just know that whatever amount of time that child or those children spend in your care is, is God ordained yep. and, and it is for his good purposes. And, and even if you have them for a week, month, whatever, the impact that you can still have and the difference that you can make in their lives. And she said, there are some situations, she said, I have some foster kids that I still get to see that I still get to know, um, you know, years later kind of thing. And others, I have no idea you know, where they're at and that, but, but I just trust that the, uh, that the Lord had, uh, uh, his own purposes and plan in place there. And, and that was helpful. That was, that was helpful. And, and, and we were fortunate in that the, the three that we set out to adopt, we ended up getting to adopt. Now, uh, our first two Austin and Gianna, there came a point where, because of some th issues happening where the state actually tried to not allow us to adopt them. Um, and it goes back to some of our Christian beliefs. And, um, and we really thought there was a time we thought that this, this may not happen. And they had been with us for a year and a half at that point, you know? And, um, and then luckily uh, there was this, just a bulldog of a lawyer, this great guy that worked for uh, child protective services who were very much in our court. And um, it was the state that was giving us grief and he went to bat and uh, and basically told him, yeah, you know, if 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 you're going to try to play this game and go this route, then we'll we'll see you in court kind of thing. And they immediately backpedaled and and uh, yeah, we were able to see the adoption through. That's awesome. I'm going to pull Cheeseman into this. Luke. Yeah. Why don't you talk about the awesome fostering of this young lad? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we have a star lord there, Peter Quill. Uh, had had yeah, definitely. So he grew up well before even this. He was with his father. Well, yeah. not with he was with his mom and grandfather, like when his mom passed away. But then um, Yondu came in and took in young Peter. And one of the one of the best moments of Guardians of the Galaxy too is you know. Cause you, you kind of see them where he kind of had a lot of bitterness kind of with how he raised them, but they kind of really became, you know, came full circle <laughs> and guardians too. And that line, you just can't really beat in any of the guardians movies where he's like, he may not have been your dad. Wait, he may, he may have been your father, but he sure wasn't your daddy. Yeah. He just yeah. That's like a, a good, like heart moment that you just, it just, that really kind of, I think communicates what we're talking about here that kind of like, you know, somebody might be your parent, but, you know, like, but, you know, the foster parents come in and they're like the true parent. And like most people you talk to that's been done the right way, you know, like these are my parents. Like, it doesn't matter. Even if you're like a different race, different type thing, you know, like mm -hmm. these are your parents and all that. And it's just such an awesome thing. And let's just say they are definitely different races. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do want to. Yeah. Wanna sure we emphasize though like jay, as jay mentioned i think we mentioned as well like the goal of fostering is reunification yes. and so there are really we were fortunate that four out of the seven we actually really were maybe happy is too <laughs> but but we it's were hard, right? we were it was still hard but you know it yeah. was like we're still friends and it, it's great when you can say when you could say that i know that they're going to a good home like that yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. And then for, as Jay said, you know, whatever part you played, whether it was three months in our case, six months, and then a year and a half, like it, it makes all the difference and you are literally, literally saving lives. So it's, it is a beautiful thing to be able to step in no matter how short or long that may be 
regardless of the emotions that might come later, regardless of the injustice that mm -hmm. may happen or not happen, you know? So I just want to emphasize, like, there are still really great parents who just need a moment to yeah. get stuff together. And, mm -hmm. and we're so happy to step into that space and where it makes sense to, to see that happy reunification. And Laura, I've got to add to that. And, and I'm, going to cheat a little bit i know these i know these folks so i've been over to their house and i've seen how you guys are support not just to the foster kids but sometimes the parents and i just love that you know like you say sometimes they just need need a break or or, or need a moment and like and after the reunifications you guys have remained on such good terms and supportive of the families that ha that you have been a part of i just think that's such a, a powerful statement of how Sometimes the foster care system does work so well. And um, I don't want to um, keep us too long, but I do, Derek, I do want um, real quick. We have a couple couple more pictures. I just oh, want well, real quick before we move on to the next thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Guardians does have a secondary foster thing with. Oh, yes. <laughs> and teenage group, which was such a comical thing that they did where it's like everybody was kind of parental with Groot when he was baby Groot and teenage Groot, especially Rocket, you know, they were best yes. friends, but then they became kind of like a father and son thing. And then Star-Lord also like brother and kind of took that brother. kind of role as well, <laughs> where like, or he'd talk about I am Groot and stuff. He's like, don't talk to me like that. Like, and, <laughs> and back at him, like he's a teenage brat. So Derek, yeah. what's this? Ah, uh, that is Sweet Tooth. It's a show on Netflix based on a comic. Um, yeah, a quick, summary explanation is it's set in this post-apocalyptic world after a virus has wiped out most of humanity and simultaneously with the virus for some reason all kids were starting to be born as human animal hybrids um and that's part of the mystery of the show is in the sci-fi element is like how are these things related um but that's uh will forte plays richard or as the main character gus calls him pubba um, it almost looks like Daniel Radcliffe in that. I was like, it does a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know, a little yeah. Wait and grow a beard. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but Will Forte, of course, he was also in The Last Man on Earth, which is another post-apocalyptic story yeah, where virus right. wiped out most of humanity. Um, but in this, he um, some spoilers, by the way. We at the beginning we see him raising Gus from when he's a baby, and they are hiding out in this cabin somewhere in Yellowstone, um, and he does that to protect him. And we find out later he had no connection to this baby before. Like the baby was just handed to him while they're trying to get him out uh, away from this lab where these government forces are coming in and just destroying everything. And, and the baby is going to be in danger. So um, the woman who was working in the lab uh, who had gone on one date with Richard is just like, take this baby run and mm -hmm. take him somewhere safe. And watching it, I related so much to that because I mean, anything, I get emotional anytime when kids are in danger and there's a story about kids just right. looking for their families. It's always been that way for me. But in this show in particular, you know, you're seeing these relationships and Gus forms this one with this character that is the only dad he knows and then finds out later it wasn't actually his biological father. Um, and he's and he's still trying to find his mother for so long. And then he forms a friendship with another character that he just he nicknames Big Man, this guy who was an NFL player before the world basically ended. Um, but in this, you see the, these two men that come into Gus's life that are just looking out for him and just kind of end up in that role, uh, not on purpose, but they take it on because they just want to protect him. Okay. And so there is kind of this parental relationship. And then you've got other characters in the show too. There's an, a woman named Amy who, uh, was a marriage counselor or something before the world crumbled. And then she goes and hides out in basically an abandoned zoo. All the animals have fled and she's hiding out there. And then somebody just leaves a child, uh, a baby who has, is born with a pig nose at her doorstep. And she takes that Aww. baby. In. And then that, when that baby grows and she's a little bit bigger of a kid, she convinces her to help other kids. So she like works this underground network and people are just dropping the children off <laughs> in secret places and she'll get them and she protects them. Cause you've got people who are blaming these children for the virus and they're always in danger. So um, mm -hmm. like that, I've only been binging it just in the last week. And it's really spoken to me, like seeing how those relationships are and how- Where are you like, binging it? On Netflix. Netflix. All right, we're gonna do a speed, <laughs> a speed round real quick. And you guys can just tell us the, the cool relationships here. 
What's this? That's The Witcher. That's Geralt of Rivia and Ciri, the quote, child of surprise. Um, <laughs> and I forget, oh, what's the line? I think I wrote it down here because I was going to mention it tonight. But it said, when two people are uh, bound by destiny, people linked by destiny will always find each other. Mm. Yep. Yeah, he makes this promise or some kind of a deal or like earlier on, like years before that this baby that's going to be born, he's going to be caring for her later. And then in season one, like she's running and he's on the run and then they find each other. That's like, I think this is the last shot of the first season. And the second season, she's training and all this stuff too. And he's cool. you know, teaching her. So <laughs> here's another one. Let's see. <laughs> you want to take this one? No. You know what that is? Yeah, it's Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is Assassin's, Assassin's Creed, Creed Odyssey. So you can play as a male character or a female character when you're starting it out um, to choose whichever you want. And then this, we play it as Alexios, the male version. And he is actually taken in, um, just found washed up on shore on the island of Cephalonia by this guy, Marcos. And Assassin's Creed Odyssey is pretty fun. It's all ancient Greece. But it's, <laughs> when we were playing it, we're like, hey, that's that's foster care. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I do want to make a connection though, because we, we have Luke threw up a couple pictures here and then we'll, we'll kind of end on real quickly here. But like, the fostering is okay this movie i was gonna I mention that that shazam exactly Once yeah. we that photo. look at this <laughs> oh yeah jay could you talk about this yeah jay yeah well um here of course you have a they're, they're all in the uh in, in a house uh you know where you have the quote-unquote parents um i don't remember their names the big fellow there on the left and the gal on the right yeah. and uh and they have these kids that are from all different backgrounds and ethnicities and and um and in in some ways uh misfits in 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 that respect where where they um not misfits by uh that's a wrong way to put it um <laughs> <laughs> meaning they they just uh they all what am i trying to say derek and laura help me out here <laughs> you know I said, we're all misfits we all need a place to belong and they just they, they had been disconnected from where they belong yeah, and they all have difficult situations, obviously that they're that they're dealing with, and and yet this all brings them together in just a tremendous way, and they realize that they all have uh, these uh, different powers. Um, I didn't realize which picture was. Yeah, so I, the I, one just, has I just I dropped it because of powers that. with his Thank hands, you. even you know. <laughs> Throw those up. <laughs> but you see them all work together, and you see them become a team, and you see them well ultimately become a family. So yeah. even in that context, uh, yeah. uh, you know. It, when 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 people have that common bond, we see that happen in in the church. It's it's a family, right? Oh, yeah. And it's not based on blood. And I, and I would I would say that family ties, true family ties, run deeper than flesh and blood. I mm -hmm. think so many people get they get kind of hung up on wow blood relations and and um, as as if uh, by by means of uh, being a blood relative, it's somehow more important than uh, than any other kind of relationship. And frankly, I've seen much stronger, deeper, more beautiful relationships with people that were not, you know, blood related. Um, so I think that's a that's a, a tremendous picture of fostering and adopting. It is. And I just wanted to I just think foster parents are heroes. It, it's just a heroic thing to do. It's such a great thing to do. And it's so needed. And here's one you know, Batman was raised, was fostered and raised by Alfred. This one just, mm. I love this one. This is just so great. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, these other examples, Derek is providing me. The Michael Caine version, like. <laughs> like, next star ending scene that's so, so beautiful, you know, at the end of Dark Knight Rises, where he sees Bruce finally kind of free from the Batman stuff and he acknowledges that he's, I, I just love that scene. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Like he, he wanted the best for Bruce. You know, it wasn't a selfish thing. He just wanted it, the best for him. Game of Thrones, Ned Stark's relationship to Jon Snow, oh, yeah. and in Harry Potter, so had a great relationship. But Harry, he you know he was kind of fostered by, by by his uncle and aunt. And um, oh, I love this one. Lord of the Rings. Frodo is raised by Bilbo. Aragorn is raised by the elves in Rivendell. And one of my favorites, Luke was raised by his uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. Who ultimately sacrificed their, their cells for him, but um, yep. Leia, Princess Leia Organa, was raised by Bail and Briha Organa. Laura, you you had something to add there? Yeah, because I I feel like we just brushed over Harry Potter. Like okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> Harry Potter raised by his aunt and uncle, who were like total just horrible, terrible, terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible, 
example. But I feel like, you know, his godfather, Sirius, was, even though he didn't really have a chance to, like, li they live together, like, that was a, that was a foster situation. Certainly with the Weasleys, I mean, he eventually marries into that family, but Mama Weasley definitely took him under her wing. And you even see that with Dumbledore and someone. Dumbledore, after, absolutely. Um, McGonagall, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And, like, with... Uh, with uh, Ron and Hermione, like those become his like brother and sister, like for yeah. real. And so well, I, I remember also Harry and Ginny end up raising Teddy. Yeah, Teddy yeah. yeah, yeah. And then that's more like a Godfather situation with with yeah. Teddy at as well as Sirius. But you know, there's you know, I, I just don't want to give Harry Potter a bad rap of having a bad Foster story. <laughs> I think so much I, yeah, this is true. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Luke, did you th put this this last picture in here? Yeah, I had, uh, there's one that we haven't talked about that I think is kind of almost probably in everybody's life, maybe one of the first ones that they saw besides Star Wars, which is the Jungle Book. You know, <laughs> you have the perfect yeah. kind of example of fostering and <laughs> unification at the end when he goes back to be with the uh, humans. I think somebody photoshopped. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you would have done a better job <laughs> well, listen, guys as we do kind of come to it to to the end here what can people do if people are interested in finding out more about fostering if people want to get involved to talk us through that if, if you don't mind yeah um i'll start with this um at least in california and in la county you can look at dcfs.gov to find out about the department of child and family services dcfs um, specifically just some of the policies. You can look at, you can search child welfare to see the federal website that has information about just general child welfare laws and things like that. Um, locally here in the LA area, Foster All is a really great organization that just supports foster children, foster youth, foster families. And that's who we went through to begin with. They helped us find a foster agency to work with, but their website is just fosterall.org. Yep. Um, and then... One more great one is AdvoKids, um, AdvoKids.org, like Advocate, but AdvoKids. Oh, there's the logo. Perfect. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, and they just have lots and lots of information. All They're a nonprofit that just seeks to, they, they do advocate for reforms, but also provide just information for foster parents, for foster youth, for anyone who's wanting to help out, um, help people prepare for, you know, just understanding what's happening in the process, what goes on in the courtroom, what are the forms that need to be filled out for different things. Um, yeah, so they have lots of advice. If you're interested in becoming a caregiver or anything like that, or just in volunteering just to help families out or volunteering for special events for foster families, like, um, you know, Christmas parties, summertime carnival things, there's a lot of that that goes on and foster all in particular organizes a lot of those. Yeah. I was going to say too, there's another organization we had started to be involved with down here, but then we moved up to Weaverville and that's, um, uh, 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 a foster family agency called Olive Crest and uh, olivecrest.org would be another, another option for people to look into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think and there's a lot of really great organizations out there, you know, feel free to reach out to con guy, Derek, uh, yes. <laughs> if you want any more information. Um, I know we have to close up, but before I would like to like, just say something about May the 4th again, because we are a few days mm -hmm. out from it. And I mentioned that our first date, was 10 years ago on May the 4th, but our first foster placement was also on May the 4th. Three years ago. Three uh, years ago. So it, it held a very special place in our heart. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and um, I mentioned some places if you're interested in like looking into becoming a foster parent or caregiver, but also we realize that's not for everyone. And there are also just ways you can support foster families. So if you would think about being a backup caregiver or backup sitter. You can talk to friends who do foster. And usually you just have to get a background check, get CPR certified, a couple of things like that, depending on what um, what your county or what that particular agency might require. Uh, but that's something that a lot more people can do who might not be prepared to become foster parents themselves. That can still be a huge help to foster families. Oh, yeah. 100%. This, is, this has been a blessing. Um, if, if we can just end is get your one minute wrap up your encouragement for people who are interested in fostering jay if you could go first and then Larrick, if you guys could go second <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Um, I, I like Derek and Laura, I, I would encourage people. I think a lot of people think, oh, I, I, I couldn't do that. Um, I don't have a, a enough, uh, big enough heart or I don't have enough resources. Um, we can, we can kind of make up all different kinds of, uh, um, oh, not, not excuses, but just reasons why we would, uh, maybe shy away from it. And I would say if, if, if you're thinking about it, even just a little bit, then, um, then check into some of these groups and some of these agencies and, uh, and, and, and just maybe start to uh, see if some of those doors might not open. Don't, don't kind of, um, just, uh, kill it for yourself before you even kind of looked into it or, or checked it out. And, uh, and of course, I, I always, uh, I always uh, want to be a proponent for those in our foster care system, especially um, because like I said, there's a, I know there's a lot of needs throughout the world, but there's plenty yeah. of needs right here in our own backyard. So Derek and Laura. Well, I kind of already kind of said my piece, you know, like there is a lot of need. Um, I would even say that if you know fostering isn't for you, like I would just even just say, like, if you know people who are parents, like, yeah. I think a lot of the times we, we emphasize the foster parents, but like there are parents who are also the unsung heroes sometimes oh, yeah. and we can do our best to support them. Or if you know people are struggling, you know, always lending a hand to people that you know are parents at any capacity. I think that is just a, a good place to be at, a good place to start if you do care for kids. Um, but the parents are also like, like, like Jim said, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but we're actually very, very blessed to be really good friends still with some of the foster parents um, of the kids that have been in our home. And that, that's wonderful. And we love to be able to do that to support them. Um, so yeah, just, just, and say hi to your mom and dad too. Like, love your mom, love your dad. Yeah. It's hard. Because yeah. so. Mother's Day is also coming up in May. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I think like Laura, I said just about everything I wanted to. I will say, you know, we talked about some of the real challenges. We didn't get into a whole lot about trying to help children who've been through trauma. And that's one of the biggest things that is really challenging as a foster parent. You know, you get kids who they can't regulate. They don't really know how to process their emotions. And they've got some really big emotions because some kids who go into foster care go in because they've suffered more than what many of us as, ad as adults can even imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, and so caring for kids who've been through trauma is really hard and saying goodbye to children that you love as if they were your flesh and blood is also very hard. You will get your heart ripped to shreds. You're not really <laughs> but, selling this. Hold on, but <laughs> it's still worth it. Um, Absolutely. because even with all the challenges we have had, we would not change it. I, I would not give that up. Um, if I were going to go back and redo it, I think we would make all the same we'd say yes to everyone you know yeah. um you know yeah. to to quote uh, uh valjean Va uh, jean valjean mm -hmm. who was also who also fostered in the play les mis mm -hmm. um or the book become the that's movie. right yeah he says he says to love another person is to see the face see of the god. face of god right so I, I would leave that with our audience because it really is such a beautiful thing that you can't really explain like you can, but not to the adequacy it deserves. It, there is such a beautiful thing to be able to not just love another person and, but I mean, yes, to love another person, but like just to know that you made a difference in that, that little person's life. So, um, but mo all the more because that person, that little person makes a difference in your life. Thank you guys so much for bringing this to us tonight. And um, if anybody has any interest uh, again, DF dcfs.gov, fosterall.org, olivecrest.org, some great organizations to, um, to, to find out more about. Um, Jay, Derek, Laura, Cheeseman, listen, guys, we don't normally do this. Listen, we are a podcast of fandom. We are a podcast of people of people of faith, people of different faiths, and people of no mm -hmm. faith. We, they're all welcome here. But it's on, there's 400,000 wait waiting in the foster care system so just if you don't mind just briefly i'm going to just close this in prayer and then to close the podcast god we just pray for your blessings on the 400,000 that are out there right now just waiting for someone to love them and to take care of them we and god we just pray that you will be 
there for the parents, the, the volunteers, the people that are willing to take this up. We know it's, we know it's a huge, huge thing, God. And we just know that there's so much love out there. And we just pray that you will pass around. I just pray for you to be here, Lord, with our guests tonight. And um, thank you so much for allowing us this time together. In your name, amen. Guys, amen. thank you so much. Uh, we've never prayed on the podcast before, so... <laughs> I hope everybody's awesome. okay with that, but we have a we have a pastor on the podcast <laughs> with us who also happens to be uh, nerd royalty. Let's just put it that way. So <laughs> let's not miss the opportunity. Thank you guys so much. This has been a pleasure. Um, Thanks, guys. This is awesome. Guys, yeah, if thank people you. People want to find out more information. Con guy Derek J. If people want to. Do, do you give out any information to people? Come to his church. Out? Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Come on down to Calvary Bible Church. All right. Or, or for my shameless plug, you can come visit me. This will be on my first appearance at Star Trek Las Vegas. In yes. yes! How did yeah. I not last forever? Where are you going? We'll go. Yes. Yeah, I just found okay. found out a couple few weeks back that uh the, that uh they were you know well putting out the uh, the welcome to me so. That's oh, that's so, so great. We want to hear more about that. I'm yeah. yeah, we'll talk. We'll, yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right, guys, this has been great. We'll see everybody down the road. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Con Guy Show, the official program of theconguy.com. Find us on the Weavy Geeks Collective or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And now on sci fi.radio, Saturdays at 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific, both a.m. and p.m. That's 9 o'clock Greenwich. It's sci-fi for your Wi-Fi.